take your seats now for this part of the presentation. Ada, in. You want to sit down? Okay. And um, now we are going to hear a presentation from the man who brought us all together here this weekend. And his name is Michael Murray, and he organised this whole conference himself. So all credit due to Michael. Um, he's going to talk about himself, so I'm not going to say any more about him. Please give a warm welcome for Michael Murray. Welcome everybody. Um, I hadn't really planned to talk about myself, but a few, a number of people have come up to me and said, "What's your story? What's this all about?" You know. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit of metaphysics after this. It's called metaphysical engineering. I was talking to Kenneth about this, but uh, to start with, I was born in 1964 in a little farm up in Letterkenny, County Donegal. Uh, I have a large family. Um, we had nine children, and my mum got pregnant again, so we're going into double figures. And uh, my mum and dad agreed that the tenth was going to be the last. There were going to be no more. So my twin sister in 1964 was born, and I popped out ten months later. <laughs> Unexpected. <laughs> So um, I don't know if I'm really meant to be here, but I'm here anyway. I think it cost, caught the last bus or something, I don't know. But basically, uh, I did a, a radio interview with Kenneth a few months ago, and the title of the show was I Am Not A Body. And there's a pretty good reason for that. Uh, I'll, I'll give a sh I'm not going to the whole thing, I'll just give a brief overview. But basically, when I was seven years old, and this was 1971, 72. And uh, my grandmother, God bless her. Now there was 11 children. There was my mother and father, which was 13. And there was my grandmother and grandfather, which was 15, all living in one house. And there's a three bed in the house, okay? And we never had any problems going to bed because the last one or two going to bed didn't get a bed. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be on the ball. <laughs> so basically my grandmother, you know, had a, a, a cure, a one-stop cure remedy for everything, and it was called an aspirin. So if you had a cold, it was an aspirin. If you cut your finger, it was an aspirin. It was basically an aspirin. Now, back then, uh, I don't know if you were aware, but the aspirin, was a very dangerous drug. I was very, very strong. So basically this day, uh, I don't know what was wrong with me, but she gave me an aspirin. But the problem was she didn't give me a drink of water with it, so I just swallowed the aspirin. And the aspirin kind of laid the bottom of my stomach and it burned a hole through my stomach into the spleen. And so I would basically bleed to death internally uh, for two days. And after the first day, I was at school and I felt really sick. I just felt so queasy, and what was really happening, nobody knew this, was that my stomach was filling up with blood. And on the second day, I remember, as I was here this day so clear, I spent all day in bed, and about 6 o'clock in the evening, I really felt terrible, and I went to the bathroom. And basically, blood everywhere. You know, so I lost consciousness, and I was rushed to the hospital, and uh, I was basically dead, clinically dead, for about 12 hours. You know, and uh, I had lost so much blood that I actually couldn't, I hadn't time to do a blood test, so I took a gamble of blood. I don't know what the procedure was, but you know, it was any, many, many more. But I'm here, so it must be more. <laughs> you know? So uh, during, that, um, during that experience, uh, I, I woke up after it, like, you know, and it was like a dream. The whole thing was like, I, and it was a dream that, you know, and I'll just kind of tell you what it's. What, a little bit what it was like. It was like I was being cradled in the arms of an angel during that, you know, operation and everything else. Someone was looking after me, you know. And I didn't really tell anybody about this because I was so young and I didn't know what this was. I didn't I couldn't make out the reality of it. I thought it was real. And then when I came back into this reality, I thought, no, this is real this was a lot colder. You know, this was more like reality to the reality that I, 
I just took down two or three. So one year later, I had another operation. Uh, the first operation, I had to cut me from here to here. And the second year, then there was another problem. They thought there was a problem, and they cut me again, and they took out my appendix this time. And the year after that, they cut me again, and uh, they did a bit of work with some spleen. And then when I was 10, uh, they thought I had spinal meningitis, and they had to do the lumbar puncture, which was, I had to curl up in a ball, and they had to put a needle into my spine to take out fluid, and they had to be awakened and no anesthetic during this operation. It was the most painful physical thing I endured, because it took three hours to put the needle in, it took an hour and a half to take the needle out, and it turned out negative. So, you know, it was, it was really excruciating. And then, when I was 12, uh, I was rushed to Sligo Hospital with uh, tonsillitis, had uh, kind of festered and whatever, and uh, during the operation, I couldn't stop the bleeding in uh, my throat. Uh, with were taking out the tonsils, so it was actually a 40 minute operation turned into a four hour operation. So basically anything that could go wrong was going wrong. Like. So at this stage of my life, you know, I had been through an awful lot. Uh, there was an awful lot of pain, operations, hospitals and so on. When I was 17 then, just coming to my 18th birthday, I fell 30 feet head first onto a concrete floor. And the back of my skull was smashed wide open. And people go, it must have been sore, but it wasn't. The minute I had the floor, I was straight out of body. No pain, nothing. And uh, basically, uh, ambulance was called, rushed to the hospital. And I was just floating above my body the whole way to the hospital. And uh, at the hospital, I kind of ended up somewhere else. It was like this dark corridor. It was like a, I'm not say a tunnel. But it was like a corridor, and at the very back of the corridor, there was this circular door. And around the edges of the circular door, there was light streaming out. And I remember kind of, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't consciously moving towards it, but I didn't know whether I was going to that or that was coming to me. And uh, I became very afraid. I was terrified. I was terrified of the light, you know. And the next thing, fear really overcome me, and I was kind of, I don't want this, you know. The next thing was back at the theater in the hospital, up in the corner, and I seen this guy face down on this uh, operating theater, and I'm working at this back of the head, and I said, I was thinking to myself, that poor bugger down there, <laughs> like, you know. And then it just dawned on me, it was me. And the second that I, I realized it was me, I went shh, straight back into the body. And the second that I was in the body, ah, the pain, ah, do you know, I was, I'll tell you, I can still feel that pain in the back of the head. And from the moment the accident happened until the moment my consciousness went back into the body, you know, and this is why the Course kind of talks about the pain is of the, you know, the body doesn't feel anything, it's of the mind. So when, my, when my mind was basically out of the body, like, you know, the two were separated, like the body was feeling nothing. It was only when my consciousness went back into the body that I felt, felt the body's pain, you know? So basically then, I'll skip forward a wee bit. Uh, what, when, I, when I came around, the first thing I said to the doctor, doctor's nurse, I was dead. <laughs> you know, that's the first thing, I was dead, do you know? And they said, oh, we thought you were too, blah, blah, you know what I mean? Nobody took me serious, you know? And I, was, I was dead, you know? And, you know so I went home that evening and told Dad like what had happened, like, you know. But for the next couple of years, the next five years, what happened was when I'd be going to sleep at night, I started to have these astral projections, you know, and they were really terrifying. And they started off first of all floating above a room and then out above the town in Letterkenny and were I mean as real as here, I could see shops, I could see the school and everything up from above the town and I was never above the town. And I could pinpoint everything. It was so real. And basically then the next thing I started getting higher, the astral projections. I was going up to the, 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 the clouds, up to the stars, past galaxies. Of, and I, was to, I fought for five years to stop this. And I told Dad about it. And he kind of hinted about a psychiatrist. <laughs> and we had a mental hospital <coughs> in Letterkenny at this time. And you know, he used to phone us 
because we live in a farm, and anybody escaped from the mental hospital always headed towards our farm. <laughs> so they would ring us and they'd say, a mental patient has escaped, and we'd all have to, where are we going to hedge for them? We can kill them, you know? So the first thing that he says to me, a psychiatrist, I thought, oh no, they're going to put me in the mental hospital. <laughs> and that was the last time I said it to anybody, because I was terrified of that. You know, you know, I better, you know, show up with this, like, you know, and that made me more than determined to stop these experiences happening. But they did, you know, I got to, you know, to be able to control the experiences and they just faded away. And then at 33, I drowned in a swim pool. And <laughs> I have to say, this is one of the most beautiful experiences. <laughs> A guy, I basically can't swim, you know, and uh, I ended up in the deep end of the bottom of the swim pool. I, I, I just, you know, I just looked up and I just couldn't make it up. Like, I was, I was in uh, Ibiza uh, Island, you know, and I just couldn't get up. Like, I had my strength. I hadn't slept for two days, so I was like partying and clubbing and drinking and everything. I had no energy. I just, I couldn't get up anyway, all that. But basically, that experience was amazing. I Totally amazing, like, you know, I'm so peaceful. There were no choking, there was no basically struggling for life, you know. But in that instant, I was back in the corridor, you know, and uh, I was closer to the light this time. And again, I became terrified of it, and I came back out. And this time, I said, I'm not going to say anything to anybody, do you know what I mean? Because I knew what I went through the previous time, I was dead, all oh, right, 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 you know, all of this. So, you know, I did have experiences again after this, like it was experiences, you know, um, like, uh, it's hard to say, but it was metaphysical experiences, we'll just say, right? And then in 2000, I had an accident and uh, my female artery was served. And uh, basically, I lost nearly all my blood within seconds and I was rushed to hospital. And uh, I was a miracle again. The one thing I had kept people saying to me throughout all my life, God, it was a miracle you survived that life, you know. <laughs> oh, God was looking after you and, you know, you know, all of these kind of things. But basically in this one again, like, you know, it was like really another miracle and I survived the operation. But again, I was in the corridor, you know, closer again to light, terrified of the light. And basically then, after that experience, I went into a real dark, this for a couple of years, a relationship had broken up, and uh, you know, uh, the best I could describe it was hell. And I got two years, kind of, I was really, really depressed, and I got on my feet again, and I started a new business. Uh, oh, uh, I started a new uh, company, a property management company, and for four years I worked my socks off to build it up. And in 2006, uh, Depression came back again with a bang this time, like, you know, and uh, oh, it was really bad. It was so bad that uh, I just one day decided that was it. And I handed the keys of the business to an employee and walked out the door. And that was it, you know. There was no money or anything else. It was so bad that I just sit here, take it, and walked away from it. And uh, basically at that time I started drinking heavy. And uh, I was in a real bad place. So I stayed in that place for about a year, and then, I, you know, I said, I need help here, like, you know, I really need help. And I went to see a priest, a special priest, like, you know, and it was kind of outside the dogma of the church. It was kind of, the church kind of pushed him away because he was kind of a rebel. And someone said, why don't you go and talk to Father Pat? So I went down to a wee town called Priestland and talked to Father Pat. And this day, I sat and I didn't really know what to say to him. You know, I, I couldn't even make sense of himself. So I sat down and I told him the story and the next thing he just says to me, he says, truth. I'm like, what? Truth. He says, seek the truth. Speak the truth. That was it. I walked out the door. This was a couple of days before Christmas and I locked up the stars. And I went, a lot of good you did. <laughs> So that didn't work, as far as I thought, you know, but there was more in those words than I realized at the time, you know. The truth will set you free. But basically what happened then is I started 
I said, I need some psychiatric help here that can help me. So this time, you know, I, I, was re I wasn't suicidal, but I was in such a bad place. Everything, I tried to do everything right in my life, and the more I tried to do it right, the more everything went wrong, nothing worked. And intellectually, I always thought I was a very smart guy because I could see what worked for people, and I could see what didn't work. And I, I could see mistakes I was making, and I tried to correct them. So I tried to do everything as well as I could, but it still didn't work. And the more I tried to make it work, it wouldn't work. And this really confused me. So I went, I said, maybe it's just the problem with me. So I went to see psychiatrists. I ended up seeing five psychiatrists, you know, and everyone gave me a tablet, a prescription. And that was it. All I wanted to do was talk, and nobody, you know, I started to talk and kind of looked at me and then eventually I got the five reports from the five different psychiatrists and every one of them contradicted each other. They didn't have a clue, you know, they really didn't. And my depression at this stage was, you know, it was really, really deep. Uh, but so bad that a couple of weeks in, uh, before my birthday in 2008, um, I was out at home and I was listening to Ken earlier on about the anger and I was really angry. And I remember the day, it was the anger, I was the most angriest in my life in this one particular day. And I was out with my mum and dad and you know, I was getting angry, I was just projecting pure hate and I, you know, and next time my mum comes in and says, you know, you know, God won't like it with you with all that swear. And I went, F God, F you know, And that's the way I felt. You know, he put me, he put me on this planet. He put me through all this. He made me suffer, and I wanted to meet him. The last thing that I wanted to do was meet him. You know, I wanted to have it out with And at this stage, the thoughts were coming into my mind, like, you know, that everything, with, with all the prescription drugs, the drinking, and the illegal drugs, you know, I knew I was killing myself, and more. And one of my mottos when life was good, nothing exceeds like excess. And the other one was, too much of a wonderful thing is good, you know. So that's the way, even with all the drugs, I had a drug for everything. And at this stage, you know, this is a little over three and a half years ago now, like, I was six stone. I was eating yogurt a day, that was about it. Uh, postman would come to the door, I would hide behind the door. Couldn't speak to anybody. Didn't want to speak to anybody. I was so dark, I was so depressed. So about a week before my birthday in 2008, I wrote a poem. And I'm just sorry I didn't bring it, I forgot, I forgot it, because I would love to have read it here today. And basically it was a poem of surrender, you know, I was at, you know, I, at this stage decided, you know, that I was on the way out of here. I wasn't stupid, I knew all the drugs and drink and the mix and everything that I was out of here. And basically I wanted to make God, you know what I mean, like, and I just totally surrendered. I had been through so much pain, so much fear. And I, I was a Tuesday night, I remember, and I wrote that poem, stayed up all night. And I don't know if any of you are aware about the dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. Do you know? Well, my dark night of the soul lasted 10 years, do you know? And basically this was coming to the end of it. And it was that night that I finally let go. I let go of my ego that night. And I slept like a baby that night. And the next day, I was so pleased with myself. I would, and this lasted for the next six days. I was just so at peace, you know. I just something had happened that I was just in this place now where I wasn't hanging on to any more hope. And as I wrote my book, I gave up hope. I lost hope. I gave it up. You know, I wasn't clinging on, you know, for anything here anymore. Nothing worked here, you know. And uh, basically, what happened then? I had an experience. Um, on the Monday night of the 29th of September 2008, I was sitting at my computer, headphones on, beautiful music playing, and my son, who was uh, 14 at the time, was sitting behind me watching TV. You know, he didn't stay with me, he stayed with his mom, like, you know, but he was just with me for a couple of days at that time. And I was sitting at my computer. And the next thing, I had my eyes closed, and something started to happen. And I recognized what it was. And it was the same vibrations, the same experiences that I had uh, felt in the near death experiences. You know, I felt the same kind of 
lifting sensation, the same lightness sensation. And the next thing, I found myself in the corridor. This time, no trauma, you know, no accidents, nothing. But there I was. I was, you know, I couldn't believe it. And there was the light. There was the door. And but there was something different this time. There was no fear. I wanted that light. I wanted out of here. So I felt my consciousness moving towards the door, you know. And it kept closer and closer and closer, and the light got brighter, brighter, brighter. And the next day I went right up to the door. And the thing I remember so clearly, it wasn't the door. It was fog. It was mist. And the light was shining all around the edges of it. And basically, I went through the fog into the light. And I mean, ah, oh, I mean, that was unbelievable. That was, you know, I'm, you know, the, 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 I've tried to describe this and words aren't possible. But, you know, if I could imagine, like, if you took every bit of love, joy, ecstasy in this planet, multiplied it by a billion, trillion, zillion, okay, and give yourself a shot in the arm with it, you wouldn't even come close. Do you know? If Mark Zuckerberg was sitting here now and he said to me, he says, I'll give you Facebook if you give me what you have. I would laugh at him. I wouldn't swallow for the word. It was a pure experience of God. I felt in the presence of God, but not in the God that I thought was the God. This guy sitting up in this big chair, right, with the book, right? Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Explain these, you know, you know, you know, my thought was that I had in my mind was the same as the headmasters at school, like, you know, because I had a list in front of explain this, explain this, you know. But the funny thing about it was we were a Catholic family, and every Sunday, one pew in the chapel took up our whole family. <laughs> but I started secondary school in Sydney in this college, and it was run by priests, and it was a brutal regime. You know, I was run by that, and uh, basically I was very brutal. And I came to, I was 14 at the time, and uh, I said, right, there's something seriously wrong here. If these, if these guys work for God, you know, you know if you, you're a representative of a company, what you represent, you know, what you do and what you say represents that company, you know, that comes from who you represent, yeah? So these guys were representing this guy. So what does that make him out to be? You know, I don't want that, but I'm with him. So my dad, you know, I used to run away on a Sunday morning, disappear. And we used to all go to, we'd all, on a Saturday night, have our all shoes polished all in a row. Or one set of good clothes all set out. When we go back from mass, we had to take them off, <laughs> you know. But I was a richer, I was a very, and my dad, you know, he, he was, but I, every, every Sunday for about a month, I disappeared. And I knew that I was going to be in for a, a you know, a good telling off, a bit of, you know, but I didn't care. I didn't want to, and I walked away from the church. I walked away from that God. And the one thing that I kept with me all my life was, you know, and I don't know where I picked it up, but it was God is within me. And people would say to me, you're not going to Mass, do you go to Mass? No, no, this is my, my church is in here, you know. But, you know, there was a part of me saying that, but there were a part of me, I don't know, didn't believe it in their life, so I was using that as an excuse. But there was a part of me, you know, that did really believe that, you know. So basically, after the experience in 2008, everything changed. I went out to my dad the next day, and I uh, told my dad, experience with God. I didn't know what to say to people. You know, I had seen David Icke that time when he jumped up on the couch with a turquoise tracksuit saying, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Son of God. And this was in 1988 or something like, you know. And, you know, I'd been watching that because he was a presenter of the snooker. I mean, I really labeled it on that, man, I'm not case like. And I didn't want that. So I, I, I just said, look, you know, I rang Diane. And I told her, and I saw wonderful news. I said, come on. She thought I won a lottery. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, like, everything changed then. And all of a sudden, within the next couple of weeks, I started eating 
turned on the drugs, stopped drinking. And funny thing about it, I was waiting for this come down, you know, you know, you know, when you go to rehab, you go through all this sweat and then you go through all this withdrawal symptoms, nothing. It was like I never took a drug, it was like I never took a, a drink, you know. And this went on right up until the Christmas period. After the Christmas, Diane had went to Australia on the Christmas period and she came back. And basically I had a second experience. And this time, the second experience, Diane was sitting right beside me. And the second experience was again more intense than the first experience, more intense. And the funny thing about it was, you know, after the second experience, I didn't slept for six days. I couldn't, I just, even at night time, eyes wide open, standing, you swear I was on ecstasy, <laughs> you know? And I, I just couldn't. And then it never dawned on me just to ask for peace on this thing, you know? And I said, oh, Jesus, I need, I need, I need some rest, I need some peace. And I slept like a baby for about, I'd say 14, 60 hours, you know, as well, too, too, like, but, you know, and then Diane handed me the book. You know, she bought it for me as a present. It was called A Course in Miracles. And I started reading the book. And, you know, everything changed from that. I, everything that was in the book throughout my whole life, every question was answered. And the funny thing was about it, I spent my whole life and I knew I was waiting on something. I was waiting on a train. That's the way that I had to imagine this because when I was young, I headed off to London and I was in Birmingham. And I, travel, you know, and I was in a few cities and, you know, I was always waiting for a train somewhere. So I always, you know, uh, you know, if I was waiting on something, I always imagined there was a train, there was a journey to take me somewhere. But my whole life, you know, I've been waiting for something and I knew now what that was and this is it. This is what I've been waiting for. Because this has fulfilled everything and every answer and every question that I ever wanted to know. And I don't believe what it says in the Course in Miracles. I know what it says in the Course in Miracles. I don't have to believe it anymore. I know it from deep within my heart, do you know, that it is the truth. And it is the truth that will set you free. You know? So basically, uh, what we're gonna do now, okay, we're gonna do a bit of metaphysics, okay? Uh, it's kind of like a little workshop. But what I want to talk about is uh, what I want to talk about is uh, the, the mind. And funny thing in the Course in Miracles, you'll hear about the mind a lot. You have the split mind, the mind of God, the Christ mind, okay? the right mind, the wrong mind. The subconscious mind, the unconscious mind, the conscious mind, the non-conscious mind. So they're all they're all these symbols, okay? So basically, what I want to do is kind of go through the first one, which is uh, the split mind. Can you hear me, okay, the back? Yeah. yeah. Uh, the split mind basically is made up of three parts. You have the right mind, you have the wrong mind, and then you have the decision maker, which is basically you and the decision maker, the you that Jesus is talking to in the Course in Miracles is the decision maker. It's not you as an ego, you know, or you a spirit. It's you who makes the choice. That's who the you he referring to at all times. And you will never ever make a correct decision in your wrong mind. And you'll never make a wrong decision in your right mind. So what I say to people is, you know, if you have anything important to make, if you have any decisions to make in your life, choose your mind. And you can't go wrong after that. You know, you really can't go wrong. And I looked at this, you know, and throughout my whole life, I looked at all the big decisions I made, and they were all made in the wrong mind. And they never worked, and that's why they never worked. You know, because I was choosing between illusions at all times, you know. so. <laughs> yeah. So here we have basically, can you see it back? Yeah. It's basically a symbol of the right and wrong mind. 
and in the middle you'll see the DM, the decision maker. Okay? And when, when consciousness was introduced, the split mind was introduced. Okay? So we heard the voice of the ego in the wrong mind, but we didn't hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit basically said nothing. It didn't respond to the ego's promises of what we wanted in our specialness. So all we heard basically when the split mind came into operation was the voice of the ego. Do you know? Or the lies of the ego, or the lies of the serpent. So we listened to the story of the ego, but at that time we still could have chose the oneness of heaven. We could have chose not to be special. But when we're only hearing, you know, what we could get to be self-creators, to have our own word, our own reality, to be individual, to be special, and this is all sounded great, you know. So that's what we went for. So we listened, you know, to the ego, and then we basically came to this point here of sin, guilt, and fear. And it wasn't until we accepted guilt into our minds that the separation became real for us. Okay? We found ourselves in a separated place, the sin, sin a separation. So basically, at that moment, we could have laughed at that idea. You know, like Gary was talking about yesterday, like, you know, we forgot to laugh. We could have laughed at the idea that we were separated, you know, from God. You know, but we didn't. We took it real. So we felt guilty about it. And once we took that guilt into our minds, the separation became real for us. And as Ken kind of used a, a lovely phrase of Pitna, we, went for, we had to go the whole way into the rabbit hole then. We had to go the whole way down into the physical world to correct this error. So once we accepted guilt in, we became the ego. We forgot we had the power to choose anymore, okay? We automatically, right, became entangled within the ego. So we couldn't separate ourselves from the ego. You know, we didn't know what the ego was, we didn't know what we were, you know? And all became one. And the ego was very, very clever. Very, very clever, okay? The one thing that the ego is really terrified of, and the one thing that it has absolutely, its whole strategy is built upon, right, is to keep you away from the power to choose. Because if, if you can reclaim that power to choose, then you can choose against the ego, okay? So what the ego does, the ego splits again. And so now we have the ego's wrong mind and the ego's right mind. Okay, so let's just have a little look and see what that entails. Okay, so say, let's say in the ego's wrong mind, we have grievances, special hate, judgment, self interest, specialness, depression, projection. Why? You could write hundreds, do you know? So basically, that's a wrong minded, wrong minded ego. Do you know? And we all know someone who really hates people and are refusing to give up grievances. And you know, they're not, you know, they are out there, like, you know. But the ego knows that if we would not put up with that tolerance of pain and suffering, you know, so we would, the possibility would be that we would go back to look for our right mind. You know, that we, we just, it would be intolerable, as Jesus says. So the ego very clearly, cleverly, sets up a right-minded thinking for us, for that's for the people who want to forgive. But as Gary was talking about yesterday, it's a forgive to destroy. You know, forgive them for what they have done. You know? So we feel good about that. You know, we feel great about that. We're the bigger person. We can forgive them now for what they have done. Okay? And also, what, what it does now, the ego knows we can't go around hating everybody. So we, ha we are always seeking for love. So it does, is it sets up a special love. It gives it a large bit of love. Okay? But it's temporary. That's the only thing about special love, okay? It's always temporary. And again, you go on to the rest of them, they're identical. <laughs> Judgment, self-interest, specialness, depression, projection, more hate. So what have we been doing all along, up until we, 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 we go back into that power of our mind to choose? We've been choosing between illusions. It doesn't matter, 
you know, if we have a grievance or if we have to destroy you. You know, you may feel a little bit, bit better about forgiving someone for what they've done than holding a grievance, but it doesn't matter because you're still here, you're still in the wrong lane. Do you know? It doesn't make one better sense, you know? So basically, you know, this is the defenses that the ego has set up to stop you from getting back to that decision point in your mind, okay? But as we know, right, the Holy Spirit is very clever, more clever than the ego. So for everything the ego makes, there's a correction for us. So just let's have a look at the correction. Right. Now, this diagram is very good because you, what you're going to see now is what the miracle is. Okay. So we get fed up in this mind. And we don't want to be in this mind. So what happens is one day we say, right, there has to be another way. We have tried this, we have tried everything in this mind, so we say there has to be another way. What we're really saying is there has to be another mind, okay? And that's the door opening, that's the invitation to the Holy Spirit. And what we do then is, right, we go back into our mind and basically we choose forgiveness, okay? There's no hierarchy of miracles, meaning they're all the same. Why? Because the process is the same. Very simple. Whether it be a small miracle, whether it be a big miracle, the miracle is choosing your right mind. It's choosing the love of God over the hatred of the ego. Okay? So basically what we do now, we go back into the decision maker, we choose forgiveness through perception of the Holy Spirit, and what happens is now we have the correction. We have true forgiveness, which is the correction for the forgiveness to destroy. We have the holy relationship instead of the special hate and special love. We have the Holy Spirit's judgment rather than the judgment of the ego. We have shared interest rather than self-interest. So basically everything in that mind is the correction for everything the ego has made. Okay? So, the thing about it, that's not the full story. Right? Remember everything the ego makes. So, the wrong mind and the right mind. The right mind is the correction for the wrong mind. When the wrong mind has been corrected, the right mind will disappear also. Okay? And what you're going to be left with is the one mind of the decision maker. Okay? So basically, what is the one mind? The one mind is Christ, God, heaven, oneness, truth, knowledge, all of the above. So that's a little diagram just to basically, you'll come across it, the split mind, you'll see in the course Jesus talking about right-mindedness, right Jesus talking about wrong-mindedness, you know, and uh, he'll talk about the correction of the wrong mind and the right mind. So, so basically that'll just help you. Now, if anybody wants that diagram, just send me an email. Okay, and I'll give you, send you through an attachment of those, yeah? So, the, you know, that's one, that's looking at the split mind. What I want to do now, right, is kind of put this all into one mind, okay? And it says in the course that you can't, you know, the mind is not the brain, you can't dissect it, you know, but you can't define it. The whole, it's laid up in the course. You know, so every every department that's in this one mind, okay, is in the course, and it's, and it's very clear that it's explained in the course. So consciousness and the mind. This is what's called this, our conscious thoughts. It's up here, okay. This is our behavior, what we think, how we feel, how we, you know, uh, uh, interact with people, you know, how we react to people are all conscious. Okay, so let's start at the bottom. Non-conscious mind. Okay, that's our true state of being in heaven with God. But the Course says, I was going to say the Bible. The Course says, you know, God is. God is, and then he says to speak. And we're like God, so that's what we are. You know, consciousness is not a part of heaven because you need to be conscious of something. So you can't be conscious of something at a state of pure oneness, okay? So basically, or, or through the ego can make the statement, I think, therefore I am, okay? Christ could make that statement, I think, therefore I am not, 
Christ. Okay? So basically, we have forgotten this reality. Okay? We have denied it. It's been split off. It's been suppressed. Okay? Then we move to the super unconscious mind. Okay? And I'll show you in the next diagram what that is. Then we have the unconscious mind and then the subconscious mind. Okay? Now, the sub, what, what's in our subconscious mind reinforces the unconscious mind. So we're not asked to look at this. We're not asked to look at this. And even in the course, we're not asked to look at this. But what we are asked to do, okay, is not change our behavior, our thoughts. We're asked to choose our thinking. And the next level of thinking that we can do, and what we're asked to do in the course, is the subconscious part of our mind. Okay? Let's define those parts now. Here we have heaven, oneness, and knowledge. Here we have Christ and God. That was when consciousness first came in to say or think it. We seen God outside of ourselves. We seen what God had. We didn't have it. Okay? He was a creator. He was a self-creator. We didn't have it. We wanted that. Okay? And that's where we listen to the voice of the ego of sin, guilt, and fear. So when we actually, at the first level of separation, we moved outside, or believed that we moved outside of the oneness of heaven and that consciousness, we forgot Christ, ourselves of Christ, and we forgot the memory of God. Okay? Because you can only have the memory of God when you remember your Christ. And in this part, you have the sin, guilt, and fear. And we're not asked to do anything with our sin, guilt, and fear because we can't get near it. But what we are asked to do, right, is look at our projections, our judgments, our victimizations, and our special relationships. Because this is our subconscious thinking that makes these conscious thoughts, anger, hate, war, depression, addiction, grievances, vengeance, mindlessness, all of these thoughts come from this subconscious pre-programmed thinking of the ego. Okay? So, the next step. Okay, that's the unhealed mind. You know? And there's nobody on this planet or in this physical world that doesn't have that. Because we all came here, so we all must have this. And this is what we're all here to do, is to heal this, okay? So basically what we're going to do now is look at how the process of healing occurs. The healing mind, undoing separation, okay? So, we work with the subconscious, cause and effect, okay? This is the cause, this is the effect, okay? The cause of our projections and everything came from our beliefs and guilt and fear, okay? So when you remove uh, an effect, and you don't do an effect, you also won't do the cause. And this is very important with Jesus in the, in the section, cause and effect. This is what he's really talking about, okay? Because when we change this, okay, this is the cause of the, our, our, our attitudes, behavior, and everything else is up here, okay? So when we work with the cause here, we're also changing the effects there. So it's working on both sides. So we begin the process now of forgiveness. As Gary was talking about yesterday, I forgive you for what you haven't done. So what have you not done? You're innocent. We are all, if you look at your brother, your brother is a blank screen. Everything that we don't like in ourselves, we Take it out, we project it onto that person, and then we hit them for it, you know? And that person said to me, like, you know, oh, my mother really annoys me. <laughs> she does the most annoying things, like, you know? And I explained to her this process, she, no, <laughs> you know, no, that's not me. But we take it, we deny it first in ourselves, and we put it onto someone else. Why? Because we can't stand it within ourselves, so we find someone else to project it onto and then hit them for it rather than the self hatred of ourselves. So think about the people that annoy you most in your life. <laughs> right? That's what you've got to look at. That's what you've got to deal with. It's not about them. That's what you hate yourself. That's what you annoy yourself. 
So by you denying it or not forgiving it in that person, okay, when you're forgiving your projection onto that person, that's what really, that person is totally innocent. You know, a black screen because the course teaches there's nobody else out there. You know, so we, we have these figures in front of us that we, you know, think are these individuals outside of us who are good, bad, guilty, sick, you know, you know, and we're judging them all the time. So let's move to judgment. We're not asked to give up our judgments. The Lord was made in the judgment. We need judgments to live here. But Jesus says, you know, there's good judgments. You can judge against the ego. So what keeps the ego in existence? One thing above everything else that keeps the ego in existence is differences. That's what we're asked to look at, okay? Look at how we judge the differences in people, okay? You undo the judgment of differences, you undo the whole ego thought system. Because the whole ego thought system is built on separateness, right? So we're all in here and we're doing a course in miracles. So say there was a room next door and it was full of Jehovah Witnesses, right? And if we see us, we're on the right track, we're dealing with the truth here, you know, we are, you know, the ones that's on the ball, them sharp, and they're, they're useless, they're to do the, then we're falling to the trap, okay? You must see everyone the same. And the best way that we're asked to do this within the course is the Holy Spirit's judgment. They're calling for love. Every non loving thought that someone has as a call for love. And the answer is love. That's that simple. And the other thing is you'll never have peace while you retain judgment. You will not ever attain the vision that the Course is leading you to that experience. Vision and judgment cannot coexist. So the first, as Ken Wapnick starts, says, the first step on the ladder is forgiveness. So what happens is, forgiveness takes us into a right mind. And I've, heard, I've seen a lot of this in the last three years. Someone, you know, does a great forgiveness test, and then automatically they're straight back into the wrong mind. Why? Judgment. They're not sure about the judgment. You know, and it takes them back in. And one moment they're feeling great, and then the next moment, you know, I had a great day yesterday. I had a good forgiveness test, and I feel terrible today. Why? Self-judgment, to judge someone else. It's a trick by the ego, okay? Nothing will pull you into your wrong mind quicker than judgment. So judgment is the second rung on the ladder that must be looked at. Move to the Holy Spirit's judgment, okay? So what happens now is, right, we move from uh, the Holy Spirit's judgment, we move from uh, victimization to shared interest. If, you know, shared interest, a state of being, Right in heaven. Being is sharing. That's what we do in heaven. Our function in heaven is continually extending the love of God. Sharing, sharing, sharing. That's what we are. That's what are true. And, you know, we can only be a victim when someone does something to us. They're not the same as us. You know, someone has victimized me. You know, so, you know, it's a difference again. Like, you know, we all want, we all come in here as victims. There are no victimizers comes in here. A victimizer will tell you that someone did it to them first, so they're justified in attacking someone else back. So everybody's a victim, and everybody's a victimizer, because we're all seeking people to victimize us, so we can play the victim. <coughs> you know? So basically what we do is we move from victimization to shared interest, and we move from uh, uh, special relationships to holy relationships. Okay? And Gary, I was going to talk yesterday about holy relationships. I know he's talking later today, so I'm not going too much into it. So what happens is now, these, we, the course is a mind training book, okay? It's about training a mind to be vigilant. To be vigilant now for only the kingdom of heaven, for only truth, for only love. So what we do now, we be vigilant now for, to, 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 to undo the, the unhealed mind, Okay, of our projection, judgment, special relationship, and move to this. And what happens is, right? This reinforces this, okay? Projection reinforces guilt. Yeah. Judgment reinforces fear and sin. You know, all of these reinforce this. So when you move to this new form of thinking, 
this is not getting the energy anymore. It's not being reinforced. And when it's not being reinforced, it starts to dissipate, it starts to disappear, it dissolves. That's what the whole course is about. You know, undoing the blocks to awareness. When you undo these three blocks to awareness, you come back to the memory of Christ, your memory. And when you remember yourself as Christ, you'll have the memory of God. And then this will disappear. And what you're going to be left with is where you never left. Okay, thank you. Thank you.